Bojo, welcome to Wa Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is MBF3C, Grade 11 College Math, and I am Bronwyn Slate. If you would like to participate live today, you are welcome to call the WASA studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM, on the television at Bell Express View Channel 972, and you are always welcome to join me live through Zoom. And the link is available through me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled on Monday through Thursday from 11 till 12 in the morning. And we are now just wrapping up week five of our nine week course. A reminder of what work to submit, you should definitely start submitting some work to make sure you're on the right track. The support questions, the ones marked with the pencil icons are not for marking. You decide which ones and how many of them to do. If you're understanding a concept, please feel free to skip questions. Don't spend your time on something that you're feeling confident with. However, if you do need more practice, let me know and I can send you more questions. The answers are in the back of your booklet. So check your work again to see if there's if you're making mistakes or if you're confused, um, but there are errors in the um, back of the booklet and the answers that I haven't been able to correct. So you already have your packages. Um, so let me know if something isn't lining up and we can check to see if that might be an error. The key questions, the ones marked with the key icon are the ones to submit for marking. So please do all of those questions and show all of your work and your thinking so I can see what you understand and what you don't understand. And then I can give you part marks and credit for the work that you are understanding if you make any mistakes. A reminder of how to submit your work for marking. There are three methods. The first is to scan and send your work in electronically. So to scan your in your completed work, you can use a smartphone, either an iPhone, the Notes app has a scan function, and on Android phones, the Google Drive app has a scan function. If you don't have an iPhone or a smartphone uh, and you just want to take a picture of your work or use just a regular scanner, that's totally fine too. Then send it to me either through email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Or you can send it to me through Facebook Messenger at bslatewasa. Second method is to drop it off in Sioux Lookout. We have an outdoor mailbox at our location 74 Front Street. We're the big red building next to the post office and there is a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. We are working remotely, so it may take a couple of days for me to pick that up, but as soon as I get it, I will mark it and get it back to you as fast as I can. The third method is to hand it to DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. Always, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact me. My email address is bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. You can, we can chat on Facebook. My name there is B Slate Wassa. You can call the main office and leave a message for me and then I can return your call. The number is 807-737-1488 or you can call toll, toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My office hours currently are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I'll go back to you as soon as I can. If you'd like to connect with me through social media, my Facebook and my YouTube channel are both called Be Slate Wasa. So feel free to friend me on Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube channel. All of our radio Zoom classes are uploaded shortly after airing and I share them on Facebook as well. There are also our short videos that explain common errors and confusing concepts on the YouTube channel. So if there are things that you're struggling with that aren't are necessarily our core concepts, but things that are building blocks to what we're doing, that can be a place that can you can check in with to see if that, that helps you understand those concepts. Math is a really visual subject. So connecting with the videos, I think is essential in order to find success. You don't have to, but you're gonna understand more to connect what I'm saying out loud and what I'm doing on the screen. So if you want to join me through the Zoom classes, you are welcome, but connecting with the replays on YouTube uh, it's going to mean that you can slow things down, you can pause things and think about them, repeat them. I've found lots of students have had lots of success uh, 
checking out the videos and spending time with them. So please do that if you're able. If you don't have access to reliable internet, let me know and I can send you a USB key with the recordings on it so you can still access them. All right, we're on day 19 of our course and we are having another throwback Thursday where we're focusing on lessons one, or sorry, 11 to 12, but we're gonna do a recap of all of our lessons up to now. So lessons from unit one and unit two, and then the lessons we did this week are for 11 and 12. Just a reminder why we're reviewing already. So the forgetting curve by research done by Herman Ebenhaus in 1885 showed that we forget things really, really quickly if we're not re-exposed to them. So we don't retain things after a day or two very well at all. So revisiting the concepts means that we remember them. We remember more about the concept because we're revisiting, we're retouching it and we remember it for a longer period of time. So we don't have to review it quite as often. So I'm just reviewing these things and we're slowly, I'm dropping a couple of things off from, like we're not doing as many practice questions from the earlier time because we're re remembering the more previous stuff. We've got more content to cover, um, but hopefully because we keep touching back on them, we remember what's in the course that there's not totally unknown so that when we, are writing your exam when you're writing your exam and you're doing that final test review. It's not completely like, what was it that we did at the beginning of the course? I don't have a clue. All right, but first we're gonna do some mental math and activate our brains. We know that mad minutes are not effective. The drill and kill method of memorizing math facts doesn't actually help us know them or be able to apply them in a variety of situations. So instead of drilling and killing, we work on developing strategies and practicing those strategies that we can apply to various situations. Today, we're going to do a partial quotient question again. This is, we have, our question is 195 divided by 13. I don't have a clue what this is. I did not do this beforehand. So we're gonna see how it goes. Uh, hopefully I don't screw up too much, but you can see a live action of me doing this, this strategy. So how I like to write it down is I still do this. You can do this mentally if you wanted to, but you can also do it by hand. I write 195 inside my division bracket and then 13 on the outside. And I extend my long division bracket with a long, um, so it kind of looks like a big, huge seven to help just keep my information organized. So I know that I'm trying to figure out how many groups of 13 go into 195. And I'm going to do this in friendly amounts instead of the classic uh, logarithm or sorry, algorithm method for long division. So I can see that 10 groups go of 13 goes into 195. That is going to give me 130. So I've dealt with 130. I've organized those objects already. So I can subtract those from the 195 that I have in total and find out that I still just have 65 that now I need to organize. So I don't have another 10 groups. So I'm going to have to keep figuring out, okay, how many groups might I have? I'm not sure. Do I have five groups? Maybe. I'm not positive. Uh, I definitely have one group. I probably, I even have two groups. I'm going to say, okay, I'm comfortable saying two groups. So two groups of 13 is 26. So I can take away 26 from 65 because I know that I've already dealt with that. So this is where we are other um, arithmetic strategies in place or you can fall back to doing classic um, subtraction with borrowing if that works for you. If not, no worries. So 65 take away 26 is going to be 39. So now when I look at this 39 and I'm going, okay, I have 13, I'm trying to put them into 39. Well, if I look at that, that to me looks like it could be three groups. So I'm gonna guess three groups. I'm not certain, but I'm gonna guess three groups. Say, okay, three groups of 13. Well, three groups of 10 is 30 and three groups of three is nine. So three groups of 13 is 39. So that is, uses up all of my amount. So then to figure out how many in total, I have 10 plus two plus three, so I have 15 groups in total 
of 13 go into 195. So 195 divided by 13 is equal to 15. Again, you could have done this in different chunks. You could have done it. If you could see right away that 65 was going to be five groups, that would be fine. If you did it by groups of one because you couldn't see other patterns, that is totally fine too. That is the joy of partial quotients is you do it in the parts that make sense for you. All right, let's recap what we've done so far in our course. So in lesson one was the transformations of quadratics. Two was polynomials and factory. Three was solving and graphing with quadratic equations. Four was the exponent laws. Five were simple exponential equations. Then in unit two, lesson six was simple interest in linear growth. Lesson seven was compound interest in exponential growth. Lesson eight was compound interest formula. Lesson nine was loans and RSPs. And lesson 10 was buying new and used vehicles and vehicle costs. And then this week we started on unit three. So lesson 11 was trigonometry ratios and lesson 12 was the sign law. That's what the new stuff is that we did this week. So let's look at the highlights of those starting with what we did new this week. So the highlights of lesson 11, the trigonometry ratios was that for sine, cosine and tangent, Ratios, labeling the right angle triangle is essential. So knowing where your reference angle is, where your hypotenuse is, where your opposite and where your adjacent angle or sides are is all essential in order to be able to do your ratios. And also that you're using a right angle triangle. That's what you're looking at. Then you can use the acronym SOCOTOA or just remember that sine of your A equals opposite over hypotenuse. Cos of A equals adjacent over hypotenuse, and tan of A equals opposite over adjacent. Then we can solve for an unknown side by doing algebra, or we can solve for an unknown angle by doing algebra and using the inverse function on our calculators where we did sine, cosine, or tan, inverse, which is what it's the second function, and you use that little negative one is what you're looking for in your calculator. So a reminder that all of your calculator must be in degrees in order for this to work out. And that is true for all of this unit, for all of the trigonometry stuff, for sine law, for cosine, for everything that we're doing in unit three. Really, in general, your calculator is in degrees, and that is fine. That's where you want it to be. All right, so for lesson 12, the highlights for sine law. So again, we're labeling triangles, but this time we're focusing on the fact that the vertices are capital letters and the sides are lowercase or small letters, and the opposite sides have matching letters. So when we use the sine law, is we, when we know either two angles and a side or two sides and an angle that is opposite one of the sides. And there were two versions of the formula that we found. So both versions work in all situations, but if you're looking for angles, having the angle on top of your ratios makes it easier. So sine A over small a equals sine B over small b equals sine C over small c is gonna make it easier to solve for your angle. And if you're solving for sides, having your side at the top of your ratio is gonna make it easier. So little a over sine a equals little b over sine b equals little c over sine c makes it easier. All right, so unit one highlights, just a reminder that the transformation of quadratics was when we had our, a tells us our opening of our direction of our parabola, H tells us the horizontal shift and K told us the vertical shift. For polynomials and factoring, expanding means to multiply according to the distributive law and factoring means to find the two binomials that result in the trinomial product. For lesson three, solving and graphing quadratics. Solving quadratic means that we are looking for the values of X that result in Y equaling zero. So the zeros are the X intercepts is what they're called. For lesson component laws, we have our multiplication rule is that if we have the same base, we add our exponents. Our division law is if we have the same base, we subtract our exponents. The power of a power law is that if we multiply exponents, a zero exponent means that it equals one. A negative exponent means that we have the reciprocal of the base. Lesson five, simple exponential equations were showing us very fast change of either growth or decay. And our formula, our equation is y equals a b to the exponent x. All right, that was unit one. So then unit two highlights were ripping through it just to remind you what it was that we talked about. So lesson six was simple interest in linear growth. 
so that our pattern was increasing or decreasing at a constant rate, it's linear. We had I equals PRT is our main formula and A, our accumulated amount was our principal P plus our interest I. In lesson seven, we did compound interest and exponential growth. So the pattern increases or decreases at a constant ratio. So it moves very quickly. Our formula, it was A equals P times one plus R over N all to the exponent NT. And our interest to find our interest amount, we would do our total amount, our accumulated amount, subtract our principal amount. And then lesson eight was our compound interest formula where we were looking at our situations had to have the word compound in them so that we knew that that's what we were doing. We would have to rearrange our formula to find the principal or interest rate or our time. And we had to use the nth root and the guess and check strategies to find for our interest rate and our time. And lesson nine was loans and RSPs. So loans we remember are we're borrowed money that we must pay back plus interest. The payments are calculated based on the amount borrowed or the amount borrowed is based on the affordable payment amount. We had two formulas that we did there, which were PV equals capital R times one minus one plus I, where one plus I is to the exponent negative N and all of that is divided by I. Or if we were looking for a payment, we had capital R equals PV, our present value times I, all divided by one, take away one plus I, where one plus I is to the exponent negative N. And then with RRSP, we learned that you can set up, they can be set up to give regular payments when you, you retire, that investing earlier earns more in the long run. And then we had various equations in that one in terms of if we're making contributions or for receiving payments. There were different formulas that we can look in more detail if you go back to that lesson. And it's important to know how to, you don't have to have these memorized, but you need to know which ones to use in which case, cases. And then finally for lesson 10, buying a new and used vehicle and vehicle costs. So buying a new vehicle, we could calculate the monthly payment and we could complete a dealer review. For buying a used vehicle, we were able to calculate the depreciation value where V equals P times one minus R or one minus R is to the exponent N. And then we calculated the cost of owning a vehicle such as fuel costs, where we had to calculate how much fuel is consumed and then how much the fuel that is consumed costs and calculating monthly cost averages in terms of fuel, maintenance, insurance, and licenses. So we have done a lot. That's why we keep reviewing so that we remember all the things we've covered. All right, we're gonna dive in to do some mixed practice where we need to figure out what the question is asking, but which strategy, which, which thing that we've done so far is what it applies to and what we need to uh, do from there. So question one, a ladder is resting against a tree. The foot of the ladder is two meters from the base of the tree. The ladder forms a 48 degree angle with the ground. How far up the tree does the ladder reach to the nearest 10th of a meter? So as I always say with a word problem, if you can visualize it, if you can draw yourself a picture, it's gonna help you understand what's going on. So we have a ladder resting against a tree. So I'm gonna draw a tree. My art skills are incredible, as in they are not, but they don't have to be. So we have a ladder up against a tree. We assume that the tree is at a right angle to the ground, even though that's probably a little bit more complicated than that, but we're gonna assume that. So this says the foot of a ladder is two meters from the base of the tree. So that means that on the ground, we have a distance of two meters from the base of the tree to the base of the ladder. So we're gonna label my triangle. And the ladder forms an angle of 48 degrees with the ground. So that between the ground and the ladder is 48 degrees. So then how far of the tree does the ladder reach? So where on the tree, how far is that? And I'm gonna call that say height for how far off the tree. So we have a right angle triangle. So this is making me think that we're gonna use trig and that we're gonna use either the sine, cosine or tangent, depending on what we know and what we don't know. So our reference angle is 48. So we need to remember how we do those questions. So our reference angle is 48 and we can see, okay, let's label our triangle. We have an opposite, which is across from our reference angle, adjacent, which is beside reference angle, 
and our hypotenuse, which is across from our right angle. So in this case, we are looking for our, sorry, we are looking for our opposite side, the height of the tree. And we know the adjacent side, that's the distance from between the tree and the bottom of the ladder. So if we have opposite over adjacent, that we have to remember is tan. So tan of 48 degrees is equal to our opposite over adjacent. You can write it out if that helps you remember. So tan of 48 degrees is equal to H divided by two. So if I'm solving for H, I'm gonna multiply both sides by two so that we have just H by itself. So I have two, times tan 48 is equal to H. So I'm gonna do that on my calculator. I have Desmos calculator here. So two times tan of 48 equals 2.2. .2. And the question set to the nearest 10th, so that's one decimal place. So 2.2 .2 height is equal to our height. So that means that to answer this in the question, to make sure that we're answering the question, how far up the tree does the ladder reach? So the ladder reaches 2.2 meters up the tree. There we go. So that was the trick question. Okay, right. question two. A flare is sent up as a distress signal. The path is modeled by the relation H equals negative 4.9 times T minus six, where T minus six is squared, plus 177.4, where H is the flare's height in meters and T is the time in seconds. So part A, how long will the flare take to reach its maximum height? What is the maximum height? So again, I'm gonna draw a picture to visualize what is going on. So I have, a flare being sent up and then coming down so that I'm gonna put on an axis because to sort of give it context of where we are. So we had something going up and coming down. And we know that if we think all the way back to lesson one, remember that tells us our A, H and K tell us we can take from our equation and that helps us understand our thing. Our problem. So A is negative 4.9. So that's how I knew that it was opening down because it's negative. Our H is equal to positive six because in the equation it's negative six. So we know we had to be switching it. And K is equal to positive 177.4. So we're shifting up 174, sorry, 177.4. So that means that our vertex shifted up. So the highest that we go is 177.4. And the, that vertex, that height happens because we shifted up and over six. So then looking, so that's just interpreting our question. So then looking back to what our actual question is asking is how long will the flare take to reach its maximum height? So our maximum height we know happens at six, when our time equals six, so it takes six seconds. So we're just interpreting. We don't have to do any actual calculation. We just interpret from our equation that it takes six seconds to reach its maximum height. And then what is the maximum height? So how hard did we go? We went to 177.4 meters. So that's the maximum height. So I have a sentence that says, it takes six seconds to reach 144 point, sorry, 140, uh, this is the day, 177.4 meters, which is the maximum height. Now you could graph this out using like a table of values. That's how I would have done it when I was in high school because I didn't 
remember the using A, H, and K, but using A, H, and K makes it pretty straightforward. So then part B, a typical flare will stay lit for seven seconds. What will the height of the flare be seven seconds after it's launched? So here in this question, we so our seven seconds means that our time is equal to seven. And it's wondering how high, what is our H when our time is seven? So then we're just, this is just a calculation. So we put, whenever we see a T, we're going to input seven. So I have negative 4.9 times seven minus six squared plus 177.4. So then I'm just gonna solve this. So either on your calculator or I can say, okay, seven minus six is one. So I have one, four point, negative 4.9 times one squared plus 177.4. Well, negative 4.9 times one squared is just gonna be negative 4.1. So we have negative 4.9 plus 177.4 equals 172.5. So let's see if we've answered the question, the height, what will the height of the flare be at seven seconds after it's launched? So the height will be 172.5 meters. There we go, we've answered the question. And then part C, after how many seconds will the flare hit the water? So if we think back to our diagram, which I'm just gonna sketch again. So when is that gonna hit the water? Our flare is gonna hit the water when our height is zero, right? So that means that we are saying, trying to find the time for when our height is zero. So we're trying to find the zeros. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set H equal to zero and solve for T. So I'm writing out our equation yet again just so that I have a starting place. And then I'm substituting in zero for height because we want to know that's when the flare is going to hit the water is when the height is zero. So zero equals negative 4.9 times T minus six, where T minus six is squared plus 177.4. And now I'm isolating, I'm going to do some algebra and rearrange for T. So I'm going to do this in sort of a shorthand to save us time so we get to other questions. But if you need practice with algebra, let me know and we can do some practice. And I'll put up some videos on our um, YouTube channel. So I'm just rearranging to isolate for T. So I'm moving 177.4 to the other side to be negative. And then I'm going to divide both sides by negative 4.9 in order to, again, isolate for T. So... 177 negative, negative 177.4 divided by 4.9 negative is equal to 36.2. So then T squared. So then I'm gonna take the square root of that in order to cancel off my T minus six all squared. So we get plus or minus six because a square root, we could get either the positive or the negative. So we're gonna have plus or minus 6.02 is equal to T minus six. So then T is either equal to 12.02 or 0 0.02. So the trick here is that you need to make sure that you're doing that plus or minus, that you have two options when you take your square root, because you could have a positive 6.02 or you could have negative 6.02. So in this case, we look and we say, okay, does it make sense that the flare hits the water at 0 0.02 seconds? No, because we know that it has to go up higher first. It makes sense that it hits the water at 12.02 seconds. So then we answer the question, the flare, 
hits the water at 12.02 seconds. Again, make sure that we answered the question. And that's going all the way back to the beginning, the very beginning of our course. All right, question three. Your car's fuel consumption rate is 12.2 liters per 100 kilometers and gas costs $1.65 per liter in Ontario and $1.50 per liter in Manitoba. It is 290 kilometers from Sulacout to the Ontario Manitoba border. So then it wants, the question wants you to know, does it cost more to drive from Sulacout to Winnipeg, which is 448 kilometers, or to Thunder Bay, which is 392 kilometers? So this case, we don't have a diagram to draw. We could maybe draw sort of a sketch of a map, but I don't know if that's going to help us. But we do have a lot of information. So we're trying to compare if it's faster to drive or costs more to drive to Winnipeg from Sioux Lookout or to Thunder Bay. So I'm going to organize my information so that I have one section where I'm calculating to Winnipeg and one section where I'm calculating to Thunder Bay. So we know that to Winnipeg, actually let's do the Thunder Bay part first because Thunder Bay is all in Ontario. So to Thunder Bay, it's 392 kilometers and it caught and gas costs $1.65. So if our fuel consumption rate is 12.2 liters per 100 kilometers, we need to figure out how many liters we've consumed. So first we're gonna do fuel consumption. So that's 392 times 12.2 divided by 100. So doing that on our Desmos calculator, 392 times 12.2 divided by 100 equals 47.824. So how does that much does fuel cost? So now that we know how much we used, we do 47.824 liters is how much we used times our cost of $1.65 per liter. So that, again, we can go back to our Desmos calculator and do 47.824 times $1.65, which is equal to $78.91. So to cost to drive to Thunder Bay from Sioux Lookout, in this situation, is $70.91. So now we need to figure out how much it's gonna to cost to go to Winnipeg. And in Winnipeg, we have to do it in two parts because it costs a certain amount in Ontario and it costs a certain amount in Manitoba. So again, I'm gonna divide up my section to keep myself organized. You can figure out how best makes sense to organize yourself. I have more space horizontally than vertically. If you did it vertically, that would be fine too. So, in Ontario, we're driving 290 kilometers. Fuel cost is $1.65 per liter. And in Manitoba, we have to figure out how much we're driving. So from the border, so in total to, to Winnipeg, it's 448, but 290 of those kilometers are in Ontario. So we need to subtract that. So 448 take away 290 is equal to 158. So 158 of those kilometers are gonna be in um, Manitoba. And we're just kind of pretending that we're assuming that as soon as you hit the Manitoba um, border, you need to buy gas. And that is equal to $1.50 per liter in Manitoba. So then we figure out the fuel consumption in Ontario. So we have for 290 kilometers times 12.2 
liters is equal to, I'm just gonna do that on my own calculator, divided by 100, I almost forgot to divide it by 100, and that would have, but I looked at my number and didn't make sense, so I have to remember that it's per 100 kilometers. So that's 35.38 liters. So then cost is gonna be 35.38 liters times $1.65, which is $58. and 38 cents. So then we need to figure out the cost of Manitoba. So the fuel consumption is 158 times, we're still using the same 12.2 liters per 100 kilometers because we're still driving the same vehicle. So 158 times 12.2 divided by 100 is equal to 19. 0.276. So then for fuel cost, it is 19.276 times, now it's $1.50 per liter because we're in Manitoba. So times that by $1.50 and we get $28.91. And so then we're going to add those two costs together. So we're going to add 58 point 38 plus 28 dollars and 91 cents to figure out how much it would cost in total it equals 87 dollars and 29 cents so then if we look at our numbers to see if we actually are answering the question does it cost more to drive from sioux lookout to or to thunder bay well, it looks, it's 87.29 to drive to Winnipeg and it's 78.91 to drive to Thunder Bay. So it costs more to drive to Winnipeg. There we go. All right, number four. How much will Kalen owe on his overdue credit card balance? of $652 if interest is compounded daily for 25 days at an 18.5% annual interest rate. So we're talking about money. So we're gonna go back to that unit, unit two, where we're talking about money. We're compounding, so it's not simple interest. We are not making any payments. It doesn't mention any payments. So we're just talking about compound interest. So that is our formula where A equals P times one plus R over N, all to the exponent N T. Remember, you can look this up. That's fine. You don't have to have it memorized. And we have to figure out what we know and what we don't know in order to complete our formula, our equation. So we're trying to figure out A, P, R, N, and T. So we have to go back to our question. So our, how much will Kalen owe? So that's the total amount that he's going to owe. The credit card balance is 552. So that's our principal. That's how much we're starting with before it's calculating interest. We, the R rate is 18.5%. So we remember decimal, so 0 0.185. N is our compounding period. So the N we're compounding for the daily. So that's 365. And the time is 25 days. But time, remember, is in in years. So we have to do 25 divided by 365 to say that we're 25 days out of a year opposed to if you just put 25, then it'd be 25 years. Okay, so then we have all of our information and we're just going to input it into our uh, formula. So we have A equals 652 times 1 plus R, which is 0 0.185 divided by 365, all to the exponent where N, which is 365 times 25 divided by 365. All right, and I'm going to put that into my Desmo so that we can see all of it and it helps me 
keep track. So I have six fifty two times open a bracket one plus zero point one eight five divided by 365. This is why Desmos is so great because then you can really see what it is that you're doing. So I'm closing my bracket and then I'm doing an exponent of, I know that 365 times 25 divided by 365 is 25. Those 365 are going to cancel off. So I'm just going to put 25 for the sake of ease. So that equals $660.31. So $660.31. And then we have to look to see what our question was. How much will Kalen owe on his overdue credit card? It's not asking how much interest. It's just saying in total. So Kalen will owe $660.31. And there we go. We're good to go. Let's keep going. All right. Number five, a fox population is declining by 1.8% per year. The population can be modeled using the formula P equals 210 times 0 0.982 all to the, exponent, where, to the exponent n, where P is a population after n years. So then part A is to use technology to graph this relation. I already did this to save some time and energy. So I used Desmos to graph this and we can see here on uh, the screen is, it is a declining exponential function. I have my years along the bottom and I go from zero to just almost 50. And my vertical axis is my population where I go from zero up to almost 250. So that's what you need to do for that kind of question is to just graph it. You can do it in various ways. Using technology, you would just put in your equation and then it does it for you. So then what is the current population? So our time is zero. So our current population would be zero years after now. So zero years after now is 210. So the current population, fox population is 210 foxes. So what is the expected fox population in eight years? So what we do for that is we look at our graph. This is why our graph can be useful. And we can look up and say, okay, this is eight, five, six, seven, eight. And this is eight years. So I'm going to go up here and where see where it hits my line. And then I can go back and say, okay, it's going to be at about this amount. So I say, looks like I'm going up by how much am I going by? Tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Yes. So 150, 160, 170, 180. I could say it's like 182, I can approximate. Is the expected fox population? You can also, you could put it into P equals 210 to the times 0 0.982 to the exponent eight. And that should give you something close to 182. Let's just quickly do it, 210 times 0 0.0. 982 to the exponent 8 equals 181.6. So my guess was pretty close. Then D, what will the box population be half? When will it be half the current population? So if we're at 210, so half of 210 equals 105. So how we do this is that we can look at, well, 105 is gonna be approximately here. So the legs 105 is there. So 105 is gonna be at 39 years. So in 39 years, the fox population be half. It is now. So this is about interpreting graphing um, opposed to doing calculations. 
let's keep going. See if we can get a couple more in before we run out of time. All right, number six, a communication tower is built on the slope of a hill. The surveyor 50 meters up the hill from the base of the tower measures an angle of 50 degrees between the ground and the top of the tower. The angle from the top of the tower to the surveyor is 60 degrees. Calculate the height of the tower to the nearest meter. This sounds confusing, but let's draw a picture. So we have a hill. Let me just draw a little slope. We have a communication tower. So we have some sort of little building tower thing, as you can see, beautiful drawings. And we have a person who's standing 50 meters uphill from our tower. So from the tower to the person is 50 meters. Again, it doesn't have to be precise, it doesn't have to be in scale, it doesn't have to be exact, it's all good. So then the a survey measures the angle from the ground to the top of the tower. So the surveyor is looking up to the top of the tower with their tools and measures that from where they're looking to the top of the tower to the ground is 50 degrees. Then they also measure that the angle from the top of the tower to the surveyor. So going from the tower to the surveyor, that angle is 60 degrees. So then we wanna calculate the height of our tower. So do we have a right angle triangle? Nope, because we're on a hill. We don't have a right angle triangle. Do we have, we have two angles and a side and is the side opposite one of the angles that we know? Yes, so that means that we can do the sine law. So we're gonna say, I'm just gonna label my corners of my kind of triangle so that we can organize ourselves. So sine A over A is equal to sine C over C, because how I label my triangle, A and C are the angles that I know. So then, we are, but then look, we're looking for a side. It would be easier. This is the one that I think of, but it would be easier to do A over sine A and equals to C over sine C. So I'm just gonna switch it because that will be easier. So A is 50 meters over sine A, which is sine 60 is equal to C, which is H or height that we're looking for over sine 50. So we wanna isolate for H. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by sine 50. Again, I'm doing, I'm not writing out all of the steps. I'm doing all the steps, but I'm not writing them all out. And so then we're going to calculate that. We're gonna calculate sine 50 times 50 divided by sine 60. So let's get any Desmos out. We have sine 50 times 50 divided by sine 60 equals 44.2 uh, is our meters. So H, equals 44.2, I could head to the, top, to the nearest meter, so 44 meters. So the height, answering the question, the sentence so that we know what we're actually doing, the height of the tower is 44 meters. That's what those people are doing who are surveying up there, but we see them on the road and such. They are actually using trigonometry to figure out distances and heights. And that's how we do that. So that was a sign question, a sign law question. All right, question seven. Megan contributes $50 every week into an RSP. If the interest rate is 7.5% per annum, compounded weekly, how much will she have after 20 years? So this is an RSP question and we're making contributions. So I am right now looking up what, I'm looking at that formula is because I do not have it memorized. And so I say, okay, contributing to an RSP and looking for the final amount, that's what I'm looking for. So that is A equals capital R, open a square bracket, open a round bracket, one plus I, or one plus I to the exponent N, so then close your bracket, and then minus one, close your square bracket, all over I. And then I have to figure out what I know and what I don't know. So I have R, A, R, I, N, those are my things. So A is what we're looking for. R 
is the $50 that we're contributing every week. The interest rate is 7.5%. So that's 0 0.075. And N is our compounding. Oh, but right, this one, our interest rate, we need to divide by our compounding, which is weekly. So we're dividing it by 52. And our N is 20 years, but because it's weekly, we it by 52. So this one's more important. We should remember to do that when we're doing our variables. Substitute in. So R is 50. And then open a square bracket, open a round bracket. One plus, we have 0 0.075 divided by 52, where that is to the exponent 20 times 52. Take away one, close our big square bracket divided by 0 0.075 divided by 52. And I'm using Desmos because whenever I do this on my own calculator, I screw it up so this way I can at least see. So I have 50 times, I'm opening the square bracket and I'm opening the round bracket. So just round on Desmos, but it's all good. One plus 0 0.075 divided by 52. And then I'm moving my cursor so that I get the right spot. So then I want to do e to the exponent and I'm doing exponent 20 times 52. And again, you could do this ahead of time and then put it into your brackets, that's fine, or into your calculator. All of that minus one. And then all of that divided by 0 0.0. 7, 5 divided by 52. And that equals 120,530 and 74 cents. I'm gonna have to come back to that. 120,030 and 74 cents. Is that what it was? Yeah. So Megan will have. $120,530.74 after 20 years. Cool. So it's really just getting everything in the right place in your formula and calculating it properly. So she negotiates to pay, sorry, my bad. She negotiates to pay that negotiates that our RSP pays out an annuity, so it makes payments when she retires at a rate of 6.38%, how much will her payments be that she receives? So let's go back and get our total amount that we have, right? So our A was 120,530.74. Our rate is 6.38%, which is equal to 0 0.6, 0 0.0638. And let's assume, I didn't change it in the question, but let's assume that she's getting monthly payments and that we're looking for monthly payments for 20 years. I didn't put that in the question, my bad. So then N is gonna be 20 years times 12 because we're doing monthly. So then because we're looking at payments, we're again going to look back at our formula and say we're receiving payments, we're receiving monthly pension, and we're looking for the payments amount. So that means that we're doing R, capital R. Oh, this is letters. Sometimes it's hard to remember which letters are which in terms of interest or rate. So we have our present value. I have all my variables wrong, but the ideas are there. Present value equal times I, my cat has decided to come and help. All over one minus one plus I to the exponent negative N. So we're gonna have 120,530.74 times our interest, which is 0 0.0638 divided by 12, all divided by one minus one plus 0, .0 638 divided by 12, 
close your bracket to the exponent negative 20 times 12. And then I'm going to put that into my Desmos so that we can calculate it hopefully before we're out of time. And we have 120 and 530.78 times 0 0.0638 which is divided by 12. And then all of that is divided by one minus bracket one plus 0 0.0638 divided by 12 all to the exponent negative 20 times 20, this needs to be in brackets, negative 20 times 12, which is equal to 8.90 15 cents. So payments will be 8.90 and 15 cents. Okay, cool. All right, that's our time today. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I hope you have a lovely day. Um, which.